At 15.30 the following afternoon, I entered Winter's office. Immediately, he expressed concern about my men, and I told him they were well taken care of. Good, he said. Now to the reason for your being called from patrol. As you probably have heard, the Supreme Command is expecting an Allied invasion in the near future. All indications point to a landing on the continent in May. Everybody has a theory of where they might strike, I ventured. Does anybody know? I don't. Norway is a possibility. Some think they might try to land on the Biscay coast, but most likely they will try to go ashore near Le Havre, the shortest distance from British ports. In any event, we have to be vigilant and prepared. Your boat will be overhauled immediately. Only the most urgent repairs will be permitted. Have her in combat order in ten days. At that time, your men must be on a six-hour alert. Instructions about your operation and tactical deployment will be given at this office by Senior Officer West, as soon as all commanders involved have assembled for our counter-offensive. Recalling his concern for boat and crew, I challenged him. It seems likely, sir, that such an extraordinary mission will require a schnorkel. Have any provisions been made for installing one aboard U-415? Not that I know, he said evasively. There is simply no more in supply. I am sorry, but you will have to operate without it, and so will most of the other captains. We'll have to fight the invasion with what we have. Sir, headquarters can't assume that we'll be able to reach the operational goals without a schnorkel. I understand your argument fully. However, I am in no position to change the situation. I wish I could help you, but there is a limit as to what I am able to do. I left Winter's office determined to dig up a schnorkel and have it installed aboard U-415 before the Allies would strike. Measured by the great enemy power we had seen at sea, I was convinced that any invasion force would be so gigantic that none of our U-boats would have a chance to survive without a schnorkel. It was disturbing to real Isa how little headquarters had learned about the Allies' power, and how little our terrible losses had taught the men in Berlin. I brought U-415 to dry dock and arranged for her overhaul. Then I telephoned the shipyards in Lorient and Saint-Nazaire about a spare schnorkel, but with no success. Schnorkels were in such short supply that only seven boats operating from Brest were equipped with the underwater breathing device. For a moment I saw a ray of hope. A shipyard engineer told me of having seen schnorkel assemblies lying around in the freight yard of the Gare de Montparnasse in Paris. However, my efforts to requisition and transport the desperately needed equipment were drowned in a sea of bureaucratic confusion. I eventually resigned myself to the bitter fact that I again had to sail without a schnorkel. For a number of days, single U-boats sailed or limped into harbour. They amounted to only a fraction of those which had been ordered hack to counter an Allied invasion. During the first four months of 1944, over 55 boats had been destroyed, about 80% of those sent to sea. The meagre tonnage we sank in that period did not justify the sacrifice of so many boats. Their survival alone should have been of highest priority, so that they would have been available when the Reich's existence was in gravest danger. With the return of U-821, the thin trickle of U-boats ceased entirely. U-311 was sunk on her run for port, and U-392 failed to meet the escort near the rocks. U-625 and U-653 were lost in the Bay of Biscay, and U-744 and U-603 disappeared without a signal. In addition to these boats, which had sailed from Brest and were expected back to bolster the anti-invasion group, 20 boats had been sent out from bases in Norway. None of these newcomers had been equipped with schnorkel, and they also lacked the experience needed to escape the British death traps. Only two boats out of the 20 reached their destination. In all, only 15 boats, seven with schnorkels, lay in Brest to defend the thousand-year Reich against a million invaders. The month of May had come with a fragrant explosion of magnolias and lilacs. These scents of new life were carried across the wide pastures of Brittany by a gentle breeze from the ocean, where death prevailed. When I had departed from the coast in early April, there had been only a presentiment of spring in the air. A warm wind from the south, a few opening buds here and there. During my absence, the trees had sprung into full leaf, the grass had turned greener, flowers had blossomed, 
and the countryside had plunged into hot, summer-like weather. Under the common concrete roof, the shipyard personnel worked around the clock to have the 15 U-boats repaired, equipped and fitted out for their most vital mission. Torpedoes, fuel and food were stowed aboard simultaneously to reduce the loading period, and our machinists made scores of repairs on their own, helping to put the boats in fighting condition by the required deadline. While the activity in the shipyard slowly subsided and the invasion jitters mounted in the compound, the enemy completed his immense preparations across the English Channel. He also increased his airstrikes on Biscay ports, harassing us at any hour, keeping our flak crews chained to their guns. Night after night, groups of Allied aircraft swept over our U-boat bases, seeding harbours and waterways with magnetic mines. Day after day, our minesweepers searched for the hidden menace, and the sound of explosions echoed occasionally from the cliffs in the Bay of Brest. Large Anglo-American bomber fleets penetrated France, systematically hammering, disrupting and obliterating roads, rails, stations, depots, airfields, barracks, bridges, villages and cities, devastating the beautiful France which had been virtually untouched by the war. On one of those sunny and portentous days in May, senior officer U-Boats West, Capitaine Zorsi Rosing, made his expected appearance in the compound of the first flotilla to brief us on headquarters' plan to sink the Allied invasion fleet. Corvetten Capitaine Winter played host to the high guest, as well as to the commanders of the 9th Flotilla from the other side of town. As we settled around the conference table, I took note of my colleagues in this extraordinary operation. My friend Hein Cedar, commander of U-984, was seated to my left, and to my right was Dieter Saxer, captain of U-413. There was Teddy Leston, captain of U-373, Heinz Marbach of U-953, Boddenberg of U-256, Yule of U-269, Hartman of U-441, Stark of U-740, Bugs of U-629, Nackfuss of U-821, Matulat of U-247, Starmer of U-354, Becker of U-218, Cortez of U-763, and finally myself of U-415. We were all young, faithful, and determined to win the fight for which we had suffered so long. Eight of us, including myself, were sceptical of the immediate mission and our future deployment. Admiral Donitz, however, had neglected to ask the opinion of those who had to do the impossible to reach and halt an invasion fleet without benefit of Schnorkel. The group grew quiet. Capitaine Rosing patted his silvery hair, which seemed to interfere with his thinking. Not until he had caressed it into submission was he ready to speak. Gentlemen, as you know, the Allied invasion is expected momentarily. You must be in the position to sail at any hour, because our intelligence has been unable to discover the exact date and location of the landing. I have only general instructions for you. We shall be prepared to counter the blow wherever it falls. In Norway, we have 22 boats on alert. The Biscay ports of Lorient, Saint-Nazaire, La Palisse and Bordeaux are staffed with another 21 boats. Most likely, however, the invasion fleet will simply cross the channel and try to land some 20 to 50 miles from England. This is where you gentlemen step in. Headquarters directive is short and precise. Attack and sink invasion fleet with the final objective of destroying enemy ships by ramming. Deadly silence gripped the room. Fifteen captains, all experienced U-boat men, could not believe what they had heard. This was sheer madness. We had battled ferociously to preserve our lives and our boats through months of defeats and mounting losses. Now, with only a few of each left, headquarters had ordered the sacrifice of all survivors without a thought for continuing the war. It was ludicrous to use a U-boat to accomplish what a torpedo should do. Was suicide the purpose for which we had been trained so long? Was this futile gesture the greatest glory and satisfaction we were permitted to take down with us into our wet graves? I regained my composure and asked our executioner, Sir, does that mean we have to ram our boat into an enemy vessel, even if we are able to return to port for more torpedoes? As the order stands, it means ramming. That is the directive I have been given to relay to all of you. Gentlemen, I have to be frank. 
you may not get a chance to repeat the attack. That's why total assault is ordered, even though it means deliberate self-destruction. That was very clear. He was indeed precise in his interpretation of the order, and he left us no choice but to perform a German version of the Japanese kamikaze sacrifice. It occurred to me that this order might represent headquarters' admission that the war was already hopeless, but I did not dare to think further along these lines. Hein Cedar, whose boat had been equipped with a schnorkel, ventured to say, I respectfully propose that the schnorkel boats be dispatched into the channel at this time, sir. It would be advantageous to hit them early and often within hours after they sail and before they strike. We cannot afford to expose our boats to the Allied defence before the invasion begins, countered our guest. You will get the order to sail sufficiently ahead of time. We have a well-functioning alarm system established along the coast. Detailed orders will be released the instant you leave port. If you have any further questions, Minor Heron, now is the time to ask them. What was there to question? We had been trained to execute orders without question. For a while, however, we fifteen captains engaged in a rather one-sided discussion of points not covered explicitly in headquarters' directive. Our conclusion was that we were free in our tactical manoeuvres, but once we had the invasion forces in front of our tubes, we would exhaust our torpedoes, then ram. The group dispersed. Each man went his own way, struggling to reconcile his own grim thoughts. I retired to my room, tuned in the radio, and tried to relax in the easy chair. I calculated that schnorkelous U-boats would be prevented by Allied air and sea vanguards from reaching any given point in the English Channel once the invasion had begun. I knew that seven of my friends would come to the same conclusion. That would leave a grand total of seven U-boats equipped with the schnorkel, which had a fair chance of actually confronting the Allied invasion fleet. Thus, at best, seven U-boats were all that headquarters could muster to head off an invasion in the Channel, and they would be facing, if my experience with Allied sea power was any index, an invasion fleet of virtually thousands of cargo vessels, warships and landing craft, not to mention the numberless aircraft that would blanket the scene. Of course, seven U-boats could not hold off such a vast armada. Even the notion that they could inflict noticeable damages was an infantile illusion. If our armies and the Luftwaffe were not able to halt the vast onslaught on the beaches and drive the Allies back into the sea, good God have mercy on our souls and on Germany. The establishment of a six-hour alert denied our fifteen doomed crews any excursions in the city. Land passes had been cancelled. I took special care of my men, trying to make them forget that their bell would soon toll. Bus rides, hikes, games and plays kept the men in motion and in competition. Classes were held to further their education. Capitaine Winter did his best to make our last weekends happy and rewarding. We captains spent sunny hours in the flotilla's resort, Le Trechier, swimming in the ocean, sunbathing, playing chess or bridge with the girls from the naval administration, who had no notion of our fatal mission. We never talked about the invasion, but we thought of it incessantly and of our death. Everything reminded us of death especially a device that preserved life. On weekdays we could see those U-boats equipped with schnorkel training in the blue waters of the Bay of Brest. We non-schnorkelers, men and officers alike, followed their submerged manoeuvres with intense jealousy, as we watched the small schnorkel heads grazing the surface, leaving only a short, white, foamy streak in their wake. It seemed that they guaranteed life, and that without one we would surely die. On Sunday, May 28th, we 15 commanders were invited by an SS division to see for ourselves the defence measures installed along their particular section of the Atlantic Wall. We were driven by truck to the Channel Coast, were shown the most sophisticated weapons, armoured pillboxes and mobile reinforcements. Groups of soldiers put on impressive manoeuvres, displaying various techniques for repelling invaders. The division was composed of very young troops, the men were boys not yet 18, and their officers were only a little older. However, it seemed that the Army, Luftwaffe and SS were capable of thwarting a landing in its infancy, and we returned to Brest somewhat relieved. During that night, we registered seven infiltrations by single enemy aircraft in the sky over the bay. The next morning, May 29th, 
I was advised by the adjutant that all U-boats were confined to their berths until further notice. The Tommies have planted one of their mines right in front of the bunker, he explained. A gunner on our rooftop spotted the drop. Our minesweepers will take care of the matter quickly. The basin should be cleared by nightfall. Those Tommies, I said in disgust. Soon they'll be laying their eggs in our beds. The adjutant knew exactly what I meant. For the rest of the day, two sweepers circled in the inner harbour, concentrating on the approaches to our bunker, where fifteen U-boats were held captive. However, the vessels were unable to find the mine. By evening, the search was ended and the harbour opened for traffic. The matter was closed. The gunner had been a victim of the pressures that were building up inside us all. Days of tense waiting alternated with sleepless nights. The increasing air raids, the sporadic activities of the French underground, the mounting aversion we felt in our dealings with the French population, the aggressive German-language propaganda of the British radio station Calais, the fact that we soon would have a full moon in perigee and a spring tide in early June, all these things pointed to the strong likelihood of an imminent landing. And on June 4th, when a British fleet of four-engined liberators came falling out of the noonday sun and down upon our concrete bunker in an attempt of unparalleled daring to destroy our boats, I knew that the hour for our last performance was very near. Then came June 5th, in the early morning hours, before the chirping birds grew lazy and silent in the day's rising heat, I took my men on the road again. We marched through the suburbs, singing cheerfully, awakening the French. The seven-kilometre hike was welcomed by my men as a departure from routine. In the afternoon, I left the crew in charge of my officers and went into town with Hein Sieda, captain of U-984. Around 18 o'clock, we checked in the office for any word of the Allied invasion. Since nothing was new, we decided to have an elegant dinner in town instead of the thinly sliced sandwiches served in the compound. We entered one of our favourite places, selected two large live lobsters, and had baked snails as appetisers. Cedar and I enjoyed the classic Breton dinner, but missed the pretty girls of Brittany who had recently become so shy and retiring. I thought of Marguerite in Saint-Denis, and regretted that I probably would never again be able to see her or Paris. The compound was silent and darkened when we returned. All the lights had been dimmed, all the men seemed to be sleeping. Only the night watch and some operators in the radio room were on duty. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by the sound of fists hammering against my door. The steward's voice cried frantically, Emergency! The Allies have come! Emergency! I was at the door within a second. Where have they landed? In Normandy. The invasion is in full swing. Away he sprinted to awaken my friends. I turned on the light and looked at my watch. It was 0347, the date June 6th, 1944. I thought with disgust. While the Allies had boarded their ships and landing craft, had warmed up their fighters and bombers, had sneaked across the channel to hit in surprise, we had been asleep in white linen 200 miles from the place where we should have been. Strangely tense yet calm, I slipped into my battle fatigues without a shave. Little remained to be done. Methodically, I collected my belongings, bundled and stored them in my closet, secured my toothbrush and a small tube of paste in the chest pocket of my green blouse, put on my lambskin jacket and locked the room, walked downstairs, out of the building, down to the bunker. My call had come. I would not return. My crew was already assembled on deck for the roll call when I crossed the gangway. The exec saluted. All men are on board, sir. Boat is ready for patrol. I touched the peak of my cap and faced the file. Stand at ease. Men, you all know that the enemy has landed or is in the process of doing so. We are no longer able to prevent that. But what we can do is cut off his supply and stop more troops from crossing the channel. We shall try our best. Prepare for immediate sailing. Man your action stations. There was no need of telling them the whole fatal truth. As far as my men were concerned, the mission would be just another normal one. I paced up and down on deck, awaiting the signal to sail. Alongside lay U-629, commanded by Bugs, with whom I had emptied many a bottle of wine in Le Trechier when the accent was on life and recreation. 
Although we sensed that our last battle was but a few hours away, we nonetheless managed to exchange a smile and good wishes. Then I continued to pace the deck. The minutes ticked away. An hour passed without action, another hour. Then the decisive night slowly died. A new day dawned hesitantly over the coast of Normandy, where the greatest invasion of all time was in progress. A prodigious fleet over 4,000 landing craft, with 30 divisions of Allied troops, 800 destroyers, cruisers, battleships, warships of all sizes and classes, was about to reach the continental shore, which was being pulverised by the bombardment of over 10,000 enemy planes. Meanwhile, divisions of paratroopers rained down behind our coastal defences, and countless gliders landed laden with men, tanks, guns and supply. While the French soil rocked under millions of exploding bombs and grenades, while the first waves of the intruders were decimated by the concentrated fire of the defenders, while only a few hundred of our own planes found their way into the sky, while the resistance of our tanks and guns and human walls slowly crumbled under the ponderous assault from the air and the sea. While all that happened, fifteen U-boats waited under the protective cover of the concrete bunker in Brest, twenty-one more lay in other Biscay ports, and another twenty-two remained safe in Norwegian fjords. At ten o'clock, still no order to sail. Not a single word of command had reached us. Our men brought radios up on deck to listen to the news. Our networks flooded the Reich with reports of the Allied landing. They told of our army's heroic resistance and of how they threw the waves of intruders back into the sea. Fanfares and military marches were interspersed to confirm that the nation's greatest battle would certainly end in victory. The crews of the fifteen boats on top alert cheered the news and tapped their feet to the martial tunes. Now orders were issued and cancelled within minutes. Confusion grew as more time passed. The boats were still at the pier at noon. Rumours and false alarms chased each other like steers in a stampede. At 14.40, we fifteen captains were told to report in Winter's office. There was silence all around as Winter gave each commander sealed orders. I opened my blue envelope and unfolded the red paper which contained the lion's long-delayed instructions. As I peered at the teletype, I froze. The bold letters fused into one another. But I managed to read, U-415 to sail at midnight and proceed on surface at top speed to English coast between Lizardhead and Heartland Point. Attack and destroy Allied shipping. The message was even more insane than our present standing order from headquarters. It required me and seven of my friends, all of us without the schnorkel, to remain on surface and race unprotected toward the southern English coast at a time when the sky was black with thousands of aircraft and the sea swarmed with hundreds of destroyers and corvettes. Clearly, we would not survive long enough to commit suicide by ramming cargo ships in the English ports. The seven boats equipped with the schnorkel were more fortunate. They were ordered to proceed submerged into the area where the invasion was taking place. The slow underwater voyage would postpone somewhat their inevitable annihilation. Capitaine Winter was pale and grim. He pressed the hands of his captains who had become his friends. He had done all he could to make our last days worthwhile. There was nothing more he could do before madness would triumph. It was past seventeen o'clock when I returned to the bunker. The radios had been silenced. Instead, the huge vault-like structure resounded to the songs of our eight hundred crewmen, who remained eager to sail against the enemy, even if it meant sailing straight to their deaths. At twenty-one o'clock, as night descended upon the Normandy battlefields, Fifteen U-boats slipped out into the bay. The night was clear. The stars glittered faintly in a still light sky. Soon a full moon would rise and light up our way into the Atlantic. 21.30. The seven schnorkel boats began diving in the Bay of Brest, and one by one they disappeared at five or ten minute intervals. Their departure was undetected by the enemy aircraft lurking offshore, ready to strike at anything that crawled on surface. As they marched submerged in single file through the narrows into the channel, we, the underprivileged, lay in the black bay near the escorts, waiting for the huge red ball of a moon in perigee to rise and show us the way. 22.30. The Coast Guard vessels began to float toward the harbour mouth. As they sailed into navigable waters, 
Our diesels coughed to life, and the black silhouettes of the eight U-boats swerved into single file astern of the leading minesweeper. First came U-441 under Captain Hartman. As the senior among us, he assumed the lead. U-413 with Saxe followed closely. Teddy Leston sailed his U-373 into the line. Then came U-740, Stark, U-629, Bugs, U-821, Nackfuss, U-415, myself at the helm. U-256 with Boddenberg closed the long chain. The moon had risen fully above the horizon in the southeast. Standing like a giant lantern in the sky, it illuminated the long row of U-boats and was sharply reflected in the calm sea. Contrary to common procedure, all the men had put on their yellow life jackets. The bridge had been stacked with piles of ammunition. The conning tower turned into an arsenal. The gunners hung at their automatics in tense expectation of the first enemy plane. I stood in my nook trying to keep my boat directly in the wake of U-821 and to hold the distance to a prearranged 300 metres. 2310. The first radar impulses were picked up by our bug and the fly as the coast receded. The report from below. Six radar impulses all over forward sector, increasing in volume fast. Alarmed every hand on the bridge. All ears turned into the wind. All eyes searched the quarters ahead. I kept my gaze circling above the armoured superstructure, but the intense moonlight revealed no winged black monsters. 2320. The head of our procession reached the open sea. With the escorts still in line, the eight boats sliced the silvery surface and drove ever deeper into the enemy's defence. The scream of high-volume radar impulses and the stream of emergency messages from below never ceased. 2340. Sudden fireworks flared up in the forward port quarter, five miles ahead. We had been warned that several of our destroyers were en route from Lorient to Brest, and we should not mistake them for the British. I focused my glasses on the disturbance and sighted seven destroyers in an athwart formation, fighting off a British air attack. Thousands of tracers were exchanged, and brilliant flares parachuted down upon our vessels, adding their white light to the yellow moon glow. The sound of gunfire and howling aircraft engines increased as we drew closer to the battling forces. The Tommies, noting our approach, halted their wild attacks to avoid being trapped in the crossfire between U-boats and destroyers. The destroyers raced eastward past our long file, and our trawlers, seizing the chance for a protected trip home, swerved out of formation and fastened onto the destroyer's wake. Their sudden manoeuvre left eight U-boats at the mercy of the British. At that moment, all eight U-boats acted in concert, and I ordered, both engines three times full ahead, shoot on sight. June 7th. At 015, our long chain of boats was racing at top speed toward the Atlantic. The diesels hacked, the exhausts fumed, impulses haunted us all the way. I found myself glancing repeatedly at my watch, as if it could tell me when the fatal blow would fall. 030. Radar impulses chirped all around the horizon, their volumes shifting rapidly from feeble moans to high-pitched screams. The Tommies were obviously flying at various distances around our absurd procession. They must have thought we had lost our minds. Sometimes I could hear aircraft engines at fairly close range, but could not spot a plane. The hands of my watch crept slowly ahead while the British waited for reinforcement. Our eyes sharpened and our hearts beat heavy under our breasts. 112. The battle began. Our leading boats were suddenly attacked. Tracers spurted in various directions. Then the sound of gunfire hit our ears. Fountains reached into the sky. 117. One of the enemy airplanes caught fire. It flashed comet-like toward the head of our file, crossed over one of the boats, dropped four bombs, then plunged into the ocean. The bombs knocked out Saxe's U-413. With helm jammed hard port, the boat swerved out of the column. She lost speed rapidly and sank below surface. 125. The aircraft launched a new attack, again directed at the boats in the front. Three boats, brightly lighted by flares, concentrated their gunfire and held the planes at bay. A spectacular fireworks erupted, engulfing U-boats and aircraft. Suddenly the Tommies retreated. Radar impulses indicated that they were circling our stubborn parade, 
regrouping for a fresh attack. I raised myself over the rim of the bridge, straining to see and sound out the roaming planes. 145. The boat at our stern, the last one in the column, became the target of a new British tactic. Trying to roll out the carpet of fire from the rear, a four-engined Liberator came roaring down on starboard, diving for the bow of U-256. Boddenberg's men opened fire, but the aircraft veered off in front of the boat, where her guns became ineffective. That was our chance. Open fire! I screamed. Five barrels, all that we had available, blazed away at the Liberator as it dropped four depth charges ahead of U-256 and roared past us. Four giant water columns leaped skyward behind the riddled aircraft as it tried to escape our fire. But some shells from our 37mm gun hit the plane broadside. It exploded in mid-air, then plunged into the sea. U-256, beaten and mutilated by the depth charges, lay stopped and helpless in our wake, slowly falling out of line. That was the last we saw of her. Realising that her demise left us the first target in any new attack from the rear, I called for more ammunition. Radar impulses increased rapidly. For a while, however, the British held back. 2.20. Impulses now from starboard. I presumed several planes were approaching. Suddenly, a Sunderland shot out of the night from starboard ahead. I yelled, Aircraft starboard 40 fire! Short bursts from our two twin 20mm guns followed the sweep of the plane. It cleverly flew in from dead ahead, making our guns ineffective, and dropped four barrels in front of our bow. Simultaneously, a Liberator attacked from starboard bearing 90, firing from all its muzzles. An instant later, four detonations amidships. Four savage eruptions heaved U-415 out of the water and threw our men flat on the deck plates. Then she fell back and the four collapsing geysers showered us with tons of water and sent cascades through the hatch. This was the end. Both diesels stopped, the rudder jammed harder starboard. U-415 swerved in an arc, gradually losing speed. Above on starboard floated a flare, its treacherous glare enveloping our dying boat. U-415 lay crippled, bleeding oil from a ruptured tank, slowly coming to a full stop a target to be finished off with ease. Bewildered, I peered down through the tower hatch into the blackness of the hull. All life below seemed to have ceased. I feared the boat might sink at any moment and ordered, All hands on deck! Make ready dinghies and life boy! Not a sound came from below. The men must have been knocked out by the blows. Interminable seconds passed. From the distance came the drone of planes regrouping for a new assault. It had to be fatal. Suddenly, some men came struggling up the ladder, shaken, mauled, groggy, reaching for air, tossing inflatable rubber floats to the bridge. As they jumped on deck and prepared the dinghies, the gunners raised their barrels toward the invisible airplanes, circling their disabled prey. The speed of the attack and the resultant damages prevented us from sending a distress signal. This, I thought grimly, was the way many of my friends had died, the silent way, leaving no word. U-415, hopelessly damaged, lay waiting for the coup de grace. Since the boat did not seem to be sinking, I told my men to take cover behind the tower instead of lowering the dinghies into the water. I was determined to remain on board as long as the boat would float and to shoot as long as there was ammunition and men to handle the guns. It turned out, however, that we would not die unreported. The radio mate managed to patch up our emergency transmitter and sent headquarters news of our destruction. 228. Increasing engine noise heralded a new attack, a fresh approach by Sunderland from starboard ahead, guns blazing. Zooming over our bridge, it dropped four canisters. Four deafening booms tossed the boat aloft. At that moment, a Liberator attacked at low altitude from port ahead. Our men on two 20 millimeters. Guns started firing at once and emptied their magazines into the plane's cockpit. The black monster swept across our bridge dropped four charges, then zoomed away, blowing hot exhaust fumes into our faces. As the boat made four violent jumps to port, and as four white mushrooms soared high alongside our starboard saddle tanks, the gunner at the 37 mm Automatic sent a full charge of explosive shells into the bomber's fuselage. The flaming aircraft plunged into the sea. Somewhere the sound of the Sunderland's engines faded in the distance.
Then all was very quiet. The flare still flickered on surface next to our boat. U-415 was near death, but still afloat. The fly and the bug had been shot away. We were without a warning device. The bridge was punctured by many projectiles. A gunner lay scalped by a shell. Other men had been hit by steel fragments. The exec moaned in pain, his back badly lacerated by countless splinters. In the aftermath of battle, I felt hot. Assuming I was sweating, I wiped my burning eyes. But Nahand came away red, and I realised that blood was streaming down my face. My white cap was punctured like a sieve, and the tiny fragments had torn my scalp. Then I heard the chief's voice from below. Boat is taking heavy water through galley and bow hatches. Strong leak in radio room. I'll try to keep her afloat if you keep the bees away. Can you get her repaired for diving? I shouted back. Can't promise. We have no power, no light. We'll do our best. I lowered myself to the slippery deck. It was split in several places by the impact of depth charges which had hit the planks before falling into the water where they had exploded. One barrel had bounced off the starboard saddle tank and had left a deep dent. Far more serious, the starboard aft ballast tanks were split wide open. Diesel oil escaped in a thick stream, spreading rapidly over the surface. With each minute of truce, the danger of a new assault increased rapidly. The boat swung softly in the breathing ocean, paralysed, seemingly dead. The next twenty or thirty minutes had to bring the finale. With every heartbeat we expected another attack or the boat to slip away from under us. Suddenly the chief's creaking voice escaped the hull. Boat is ready for restricted dive. Twenty metres no more. Only one motor good for eighty revolutions. Can you hold her at twenty metres or will she go to the bottom? I can't tell. We ought to try. I tried. Quickly the men climbed up the bridge and dropped one by one through the round opening into their iron coffin. I watched the deck gradually sink below surface. As the water crept up to the bridge, I slammed the lid shut. Seconds later, the floods engulfed the boat. The interior looked as if a tornado had struck. In the shimmer of emergency lighting, I saw that the floor plates were strewn with pipes, ducts, cables, glass, handwheels, bunks, tables. Water gushed from the leak in the radio room and poured through the bow and galley hatches. Both drive shafts were bent, the starboard shaft so severely that it could not be turned. The forward batteries were cracked and the acid had flooded the compartment. Our radio room was a shambles and the gyro compass was wrecked. The depth finder was shattered, the electric and diesel compressors were demolished, both periscopes were out of order, the starboard diesel was knocked off its foundation and the main centrifugal pump was ruined. Since the rudders and hydroplanes were jammed, I ordered them operated manually. Gentle, silent running. Only the fine humming of the one electric motor and the muffled clanking of tools could be heard. The stress, the terrible strains on body and mind, slowly faded. For hours we glided along, myself at the control and the chief supervising the repairs. We travelled almost blind, steering only by an inaccurate magnetic compass, always aware that the boat might suddenly fall away. 10.27. A sudden shock rocked the boat at 27 metres. Two more shocks followed. She had hit the reefs off the coast of Brittany. It was a terrifying situation, for I had no scope to use to orient myself. Right full rudder, blow buoyancy tank three, steer 270. Another shock and another, then a piercing sound. The drum made a violent jerk and lunged up to 15 metres. One, two, three sharp clanks, an unearthly grinding, and the boat shuddered under a new collision. The force of impact almost tossed her to surface, where we would not have lasted longer than a few minutes. Then the boat swung lazily onto a westward course, which I thought would carry her clear of the deadly rocks. 10.45. The chief dropped from the conning tower and reported the upper scope repaired. I took his position in the tower. When the eye of the tube finally cleared the water, I was shocked to see black rocks looming up all around us. Atop one huge pinnacle to the northeast stood the lighthouse of Cressant. We had been caught in the current, which would soon dash us against the sharp rocks. Recoiling from the terrible vision, I cried, Chief, what's the highest revolution for port shaft? 120. Make it 150 or we'll crash into the cliffs. 
Through the scope, I spotted a squadron of low-flying planes, then focused on the lighthouse to check our progress against the current. There was no forward motion. I hollered, Chief, give me another fifty revolutions. I can't take that responsibility. The motor is going to bust, he screamed back. The hell with responsibility. Give me two hundred and make it fast. Soon I felt the increased vibration. I focused on one of the threatening rocks. The boat made some headway westward. With agonising laziness, she crept toward the exit of the trap. Forty minutes later, we had outflanked the westernmost rocks, and I mopped my sweaty neck in relief. After the tide had turned, I swung U-415 on her previous southbound course and reduced the revolutions of the shaft to a safer 100. Thirteen o'clock. The chief brought me the shattering news that we would run out of power in less than two hours. If so, we would have to scuttle the boat. But I was not ready to give up the ship. I hoped to reach the usual pickup point with a bold surface dash. 1330, periscope depth. The sky was alive with aircraft flying in formations of four and six. Land was nowhere in sight. 1345, periscope depth. A squadron of two-engined planes skimmed the surface a mile to the north. 1358, two liberators flew in from the east. I retracted the scope and waited. 1410, upscope. An unevenness at the southern horizon convinced me that we were nearing the outermost cliffs of Brest. A quick check. Three two-engined aircraft had sneaked in from astern. I downed the scope as fast as its motor allowed. 1418. There were no black dots defacing the blue sky. It was our chance to try the dash to the point of rendezvous and radio for help. 1420. The boat broke surface. As I reached the bridge, the brilliant sun blinded me. The one diesel coughed and the sluggish boat gained speed slowly. I nervously scanned the sky while the radio mate fumbled with the dials of the emergency transmitter, trying to send the vital signal for air cover. Then minutes of solitude on the bridge. The boat limped through the hostile sea, trailing a flag of heavy oil. For inexplicable minutes, the sky remained empty. After improbable minutes, we arrived at the calculated intersection with the escorts. I turned the boat east to reduce the distance to land. But then our time expired. Five two-engined planes appeared over the horizon astern. We dived instantly. Disaster. The boat, drained of electric power, went out of control, drove her stem into the bottom, then settled with a hard jolt at a depth of 42 metres. Long seconds later, a spread of explosions bellowed above. Water gushed into the boat and splashed over the floor plates, filled the bilges, and threatened to flood the electrical compartment in the stern. The water increased the weight of the boat tremendously, and if the enemy kept us submerged too long, U-415 might never be able to lift her weight off the bottom. 1935. High water short-circuited the power supply for our only working pump. The chance to lift the boat grew dimmer fast. The hull was as silent as a tomb. Only the soft trickle of water was heard. I closed the green curtain around my bunk and considered the few alternatives left to me. Twenty-three o'clock. I expected action from base at any time now, if anyone had heard our call. I ordered the sound gear turned on, but the only noise the mate distinguished was our own. One o'clock. There was still no trace of a sound in the east where port and rescue seemed so close. I decided to risk waiting another two hours, then try a lonely breakthrough. One fifty. Faint propeller noises dead ahead. The mate's voice electrified me. I joined him, putting on an extra pair of earphones. The escort's sound did not increase. It soon diminished completely. I felt the entire weight of the masses of water above the boat physically resting on my own body. Had the escort stopped? Was our fix inaccurate? Had they been attacked by planes and been sent running back to port? 307. The sound reappeared and grew louder quickly. The threshing noise of two propellers stood out clearly. I had to act fast or the vessels would turn away from the empty surface. 308. Blow all tanks. The air swished into the tanks, but U-415 lay motionless. 309. Stop blowing one and three, all men to the rear. No movement from the boat. 310. All men to the bow, blow all tanks, I cried. 311. All men aft. I broke out in a cold sweat. 312. 
All men to the bow run, fellows, run. The compressed air ceased to flow. 3.13. All men aft again. Then, very gently, the boat began to sway. She listed, shuddered, then rose and rose. U-415 had worked herself free. With a distinct shock, she broke through the surface and lay abruptly still. I flipped open the lid and popped into darkness. The two shadows short of our bow swung around. I signalled by lamp that we were incapacitated and could make only five knots. At once, one of the escorts turned and set herself in our wake. Thus taken between the two vessels, U-415 began her slow march into port. 4.45. Manoeuvring with difficulty on our one lame diesel, I aimed my ship toward the illuminated square in the bunker, where I saw a few black figures waiting on the pier. The bow bounced off the concrete head wall, but the lines, already fastened at the pillars on land, held the boat steady. The moment the gangway was down, Capitaine Winter rushed aboard and pressed my hand. He was visibly moved. I am glad to see you and your men again. You better get your face cleaned. You look like a pirate. Send the boys to their quarters and let them rest. See me later whenever you are ready to talk. He turned toward my men, saluted, then returned to the pier. As I crossed the gangway, I was greeted solemnly by Sax and Boddenberg, who had made it back the previous night. Their boats had been towed into port by the escorts which had fled in the destroyer's wake when our column of U-boats was attacked. I dragged myself up the hill and into my room. With deep appreciation, I thanked my lucky star. I believed that U-415 had made her last patrol. She was so badly wrecked that I did not expect to get her repaired. Now headquarters would have to give me a new boat with a schnorkel. Solaced by this conviction, I showered, washed off the blood and sweat, then rolled between soft white sheets and fell into a death-like sleep. Heavy pain wrenched me back into the world at noon. My head ached from the shrapnel wounds. The pain drilled through my flesh in the rhythm of my heartbeat. The blazing sun hurt my eyes. I dressed in agony and laboured to the compound hospital two blocks away. A young doctor inspected the wounds and said, I'll have to shave your head to get down to the root of your problem. I argued until the doctor agreed to remove only small patches of hair. He iced my skull, then probed and cut and stitched for nearly an hour before releasing me. Relieved of my pain, I visited my wounded exec and gunner. Both had been well cared for and would mend without difficulty. They were in good spirits and asked me not to look for replacements. I soon discovered that the Allied invasion of Normandy was still touch and go. American beachheads on the Cotentin Peninsula and British landings near Bayeux might yet be wiped out. Our lines had taken punishment, but they had not been broken. Meanwhile, however, the pitiful remnants of our U-boat force had been decimated once again. In the month preceding that fateful 6th day of June, 25 boats had been sunk, raising our total casualties to the incredible number of 440 boats, and leaving us with less than 60 operational U-boats to counter the invasion. Most of this complement had been kept in Norwegian and southern Biscay ports. The only boats which saw action were the 15 that sailed from Brest. Of the eight schnorkelless boats which had been sent out to commit suicide, five never returned to base. And we three survivors, U-415, U-413, and U-256 had escaped only by accident. As a result of our heavy losses, Admiral U-boats rescinded the mad order to march on surface and ram enemy ships, thereby postponing the final destruction of the U-boat fleet. As for the seven schnorkel boats which had left Brest with us on June 6th, their fate was not yet known. But five other schnorkel boats had been sent from the Atlantic into the Channel to offset our losses, and only two arrived there. Thus we had lost at least twelve boats in the first phase of the invasion. U-415 had been put into dry dock. Practically everything aboard needed fixing or replacement, from our badly dented hull to the two useless drive shafts. My chief had itemised nearly 500 important repairs, but the list was cut down to 55 because of the shortage of parts and time. Every available boat had to be sent back to sea as soon as possible, even if she were barely capable of fighting. Somehow U-415, with all of her woes, was to be patched up for another patrol within two weeks. 
While the work went forward, I kept demanding a schnorkel, but was repeatedly turned down. The explanation was that our supply trains were being sabotaged en route by the French underground. In desperation, I tried to hire a truck to conduct my own hunt, but I was forbidden to risk a cross-country trip. Even common equipment and parts were in such short supply that it was decided to cannibalise U-256 in order to outfit U-413 and U-415. Boddenberg, the commander of U-256, decommissioned his wrecked boat and departed with his crew for home and a new command. With Boddenberg's departure, Sachs and I became the last U-boat captains in Brest. We realised that the men who gave the orders had lost their good judgement and even their common sense, but we were trained to obey orders, sane or otherwise, and so we would die in U-415 and U-413. We never voiced our thoughts, never disturbed each other with any reference to our imminent, senseless deaths. We tried to concentrate on our duties, and we listened with growing concern to the news from Normandy, including the official armed forces communiques and the more accurate reports direct from the battlefields to the north. During the second and third week of the invasion, the Anglo-Americans gradually consolidated their hold on the Cotentin Peninsula then broke through our front in two places and began driving west. However, new German divisions were rushed into battle, and we still were hopeful that our lines would hold firm. In the same period, the U-boat war continued to deteriorate. U-247, a schnorkel boat, was savagely beaten by destroyers and was forced to return to port before she entered the channel. U-269, another schnorkel boat under Uhl, was sunk off the southern coast of England. Five schnorkelless boats finally sailed from Norwegian ports and were sunk in quick succession. By June 30th, U-boat operations since the invasion began were a full-fledged disaster. We had sunk only five Allied cargo ships and two destroyers, and we had lost 22 U-boats. During the last days of June, headquarters sent me an unwelcome surprise. Three young and very inexperienced officers arrived to replace my veterans. They were to get their first and probably fatal taste of submarine warfare. My crew viewed them with obvious scepticism, and the loss of my experienced officers left a huge vacuum that only I could fill. As I staggered under the weight of this added burden, U-415 was declared fit and seaworthy on June 30th. On the eve of my new patrol, I received a letter from home. It told me that my parents and sister had moved into an apartment in the centre of Darmstadt, the capital of Hesse, and that Trudy was expecting a baby in the fall. News of the baby delighted me, but I heartily disapproved father's move back to a town into constant danger of air attack. I told him so in my last letter home. I did not tell him how death was coming ever closer to me. In a grim mockery of my prospects, I finished the letter with a cheerful wish for an early Wiedersehen.